That would be fine with me. I Maybe just... it's more fun after city council. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Jeff Schneider is yeah, for a secretarian. Because we don't have the magical pink sheet. Yeah. I've never, never done it. I just oh, that. so regular My sheet. family doesn't call oh, it that. So anyway. Sheet. That'll be a neat experience. Especially and, in uh, yeah, Mexico. It, yes. Very cool. You could so I told my kids and my friends that one has I, like, I was asked if I would run. Like, I said, no, I'm What agenda item you're about. speaking to? It's got your name. Yeah, what agenda item you're speaking to? There it is. How about I can do that? Items on it. Yeah, yeah. On this table. <laughs> the kids passed this out, Miss Jan. Mm -hmm. Oh. Just for our knowledge. I don't know what to do without Paulette. <laughs> I know. We should have a meeting without Who's that now? I have an extra. Paulette's father in law. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. Surely you've got an extra pen in I there. I do. Okay. I have one. Just keeps walking away. Yeah. You guys going to be doing this? I don't think it's going to be used anyway. <laughs> I think Leah's got a pen. <laughs> Me not get it back, though. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Still carry a sack. I've got one here. Okay. That's perfect. You know, I need to talk to Lindsay about in the kids' costumes. I don't think that usually there's a costume store in town. I don't think there is one this year, is there? Usually they have one in the mall. Uh, no, I've not seen a standalone, but yeah. Walmart has a lot of They have stuff, stuff yeah. yeah. When does our yeah. new Paula start? Hmm? When does the new Paulette start? Um, end of the month or the beginning of November. Okay. New Paulette. End of the month. Same time. So we've got them coinciding nicely with each other. They're transitioning this week, actually, some. so. Well, they were. It may be next week now. You good? Okay. We will call the meeting to order. This is the time and place for the October 17, 2022 regular school board meeting for the Marshalltown Community School District. <coughs> welcome to those of you uh, attending here in person. Welcome to anybody tuning in via the live stream or watching later on uh, at their convenience. Let me do introductions here before we get going. Board members at the meeting tonight, to my right, Zach Wall, Bonnie Lowry, and Jan McGinnis. To my left, Karina Hernandez, Sarah Faltis, and Leah Stanley. Uh, joining me here at the center table is Dr. Theron Schutte, the superintendent of schools. I am Sean Heitman. And then we've got three of our student board members here tonight, uh, Natalie Andrade, Jackson Eisenbarth, and Yesenia Alvarez Zamora. Uh, we've got a pink sign-up sheet here on the speaker's table. If you're here to uh, give public comment or to speak to any agenda item, we'd ask that you please sign up there. Um, please understand that Iowa law prohibits the discussion of specific employees of the district or their job performance. Please also understand that due to or per board policy, board members may not respond to any comments that are made. With those items out of the way, would you all please join me in uh, reciting the mission statement of the Marshalltown Community School District. We, we develop learners who have, have the knowledge, skills, skills and, and positive mindset to, to successfully, successfully pursue a meaningful future through, through personalized, personalized learning, learning experiences. experiences. And please stand as you're able and join in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any amendments or changes to the agenda? Uh, the only change is that we will need to table uh, agenda item 5.02, Pandemic Funding Overview, due to uh, Paulette's absence today. Okay. With that, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. McGinnis Lowry, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion is approved. Adam? Uh, 
good evening. So, oh, uh, good evening. So uh, tonight we have a couple of recognitions. The first is for National School Bus Safety Week, which is this week. Um, it's the beginning and end of the day of the school day is one of the most crucial time periods, and our transportation staff do a great job of making sure that students get where they need to go safely and efficiently. So uh, they are a really key aspect to actually getting students into the classrooms and back home successfully, as well as to and from school events successfully. So uh, we're really appreciative of all of our transportation staff, including bus monitors and bus drivers. And uh, uh, I also want to, you may remember last year we had some colorful signs put, or uh, not signs, but uh, artwork put in place uh, saying look both ways at each of our schools. So it serves as a really good reminder as this whole week is of uh, just maintaining awareness and mm -hmm. keeping safety in mind, especially as you're uh, moving about the town near our schools during the beginning and end of the day. So. Um, and then the other recognition last week was National School Lunch Week. So again, I don't think I, I need to explain the, the importance of uh, a healthy school lunch as well as the breakfast we provide to our students. Those fuel learning kids uh, need a full belly to learn optimally. So our, our food service staff does a great job of providing that to all of our students. Thanks, Adam. Thanks. Looking at the consent agenda, uh, we've got minutes from the October 4 uh, school board meeting. We've got personnel items. Dr. Ryan's not here, so I will assume there's nothing of great note. Although I did notice a certain individual as the seventh grade basketball coach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We're expecting great things. Yeah. <laughs> Our first practice was this morning. Ooh. Uh, interagency agreements and contracts, we've got a contract with the Iowa Department of Public Health for the Personal Responsibility Education Program, a counseling service agreement with Wild Spirit Counseling Services, a partnership agreement with Every Step Grief and Loss Services, a counseling service agreement with Boys Town, Iowa, uh, an amendment to the contract with the Iowa Department of Public Health for the Sexual Risk Avoidance Education Program, a conflict waiver with Allers and Cooney, and an amendment to the End User License Agreement with Infinite Campus. Questions about any of those agreements? Karina, I assume you're gonna abstain when we get there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, open enrollments, we have two, one in and one out. Uh, we've got bills and the financial report and if Paulette were here I would ask her if there was anything of note and she would undoubtedly say no. <laughs> <laughs> then we've got the teacher quality committee members for the 22-23 school year. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. Thanks. Lowry Faltis, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. And are there any abstentions? Abstain. Motion carries six to zero with one abstention. Nobody's on the pink sheet. So, Amy, you guys are up. Bonnie and Sarah. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see everybody. So um, I'm going to start by doing some introductions. I'm Amy Williams, principal, and Heather Stanley is an EL teacher at Hoagland. Um, Mallory Kern, instructional coach at Hoagland, and Molly Tafta is a preschool teacher at Hoagland. Um, you're going to see some videos of Deshauna Garth and those board members who were able to visit Hoagland um, last week, saw her in action. Um, she's at new teacher mentoring tonight, so was unable to join us. 
Let me go ahead to go to the next slide. So some of the highlights that we'll share with you this evening, um, first of all, with preschool, we have some new curriculum that we're implementing um, in the district. It's called Frog Street. So we'll tell you a little bit about that. We also wanna to talk to you a little bit about transitional kindergarten. So transitional kindergarten um, has been, we refer to that as TK, um, has been at Fisher Elementary in the past. Um, I believe last year um, we were without transitional kindergarten and we brought it back to Hoagland and Anson um, this year. And um, it's a full day program as opposed to a half day program in the past. So we'll get into some of the details about that. Um, we're gonna share with you some of our um, student community involvement opportunities that we've had this year, as well as give you a little update on Bobcat Buddies. Those of you who have been on the board before have heard about Bobcat Buddies in the past. Okay, I'm gonna start us off and talk a little bit about preschool um, and the components of their day. And then Molly is gonna go into a little bit more about the things that they've been learning. Um, and we have some pictures and some videos to share with you. Um, but this year is our first year of implementing new curriculum, Frog Street, like Amy said. And so um, this slide just highlights um, the components of their day. So they start, um, their morning or afternoon for the afternoon class with a greeting circle and morning message. Um, they do music and movement activity. They have two whole group read alouds um, and some practice centers, which allow for some academic extension and also some choice play. And during those practice center times, um, students are engaged in both literacy and math small groups um, that Molly teaches. They end their time together in a closing <coughs> circle and then they move into some outdoor play. And so if you go to the next slide, we have some photos from our preschool classroom. And so over on the left is um, a highlight of their daily commitments. And so every day when they get to school, the students select one of four commitments that they are going to work um, to kind of show during the day. So there's listening ears and safe feet, helping hands. Um, and so they, they make that selection every day and give some feedback to each other on that and um, provide opportunities for teachers to give feedback on that. Then the picture next to that is um, their music and movement time. Um, in the middle there, well, those last three pictures are actually just some pictures from their practice centers. So there's um, some students in the library center. Um, second to the right there is some students at the writing center. So on this particular day, they were doing some tracing for their fine motor. And then up there on the top right are some students working together on building some letters with some lines and some curves. Um, and so I will talk just a little bit about the content. So these are all of the themes that will work through the entire year. Um, so far, we are halfway through theme two. Um, each theme is four weeks, and um, so we've been talking about families, and one thing that I really have enjoyed with this curriculum is that it's like very cross-curricular. So we talk about families during our read-aloud, and then we also talk about like big and small and math, and we can take that back and refer back to families. We have small families and big families. Um, and so the themes kind of go across all of the content areas. Um, and you'll see that in one of the videos on the next slide that I'm using a read aloud book to um, teach my small group math lesson. Um, and I also enjoy that all the different themes are very um, interesting to four, four and five year olds. And so the kids are excited to learn about them and excited to get to a new theme and a new topic. Um, so yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, on the left, the video is going to be um, two students working um, on matching and patterning. And um, that is an activity they're doing during the practice center time. <laughs> and then that video is um, 
a video of me teaching small group math. And again, I'm using a read aloud from the previous week as the beginning of our math small group to teach that math lesson. So, we've been talking about families, right? And we talked about how families can be small or they can be big, okay? So we're gonna go through this book that we read last week and look at the families and we're gonna count how many people are in each family. Esther, scoot over so you can see the book. Scoot over, Jeremiah, so you can see the book. We're gonna count how many. Let's start on this page. How many people are in this family? Let's count them, ready? One, two, three, four. How many people are in this family? Four, can you show me four? Four. I'm four. I'm four. You guys are all four. You're all four. Okay, let's see. Let's find a different family and see if we can count how many people are in that family. Look at, let's look at this family. Let's count how many people are in that family. One, two, three, four. How many people are in that family? Four. Let's count this family. Ready? One, two, three. How many? Three. Can you show me three? Three. So. <laughs> Any questions about preschool? Mm -hmm. Okay, if they come to you, you can ask mm -hmm. at the end. So transitional kindergarten, TK. It is kindergarten. Um, it's a full day program. It uses the same curriculum as our kindergarten students are exposed to. Um, they have and attend special area classes that are the same length um, as our um, kindergarten class uh, students do. It's intended for kids who are young for kindergarten and could benefit from greater social, emotional, or academic development. Um, and so what we do as um, community preschools, as well as our own district preschools, is we have conversations with families and we make recommendations for them. So if they fall into that arena of April, May, June, July, early September, August, and early September, um, and we see um, that socially, emotionally, academically, that they could benefit um, from a program like TK, we might make that recommendation to families. It does offer a smaller class size. We cap off at 12. Um, I believe Anson and Hoagland are right in that eight or nine range right now. Um, and the emphasis that we've really worked to include is on social emotional learning. And when I pass the baton to Heather here, she's going to go through the daily schedule and kind of talk about some of the differences between, between TK and um, kindergarten. Um, some people will say, you know, transitional kindergarten goes at a slower pace. It really doesn't. And so hopefully looking at um, some clips of the schedule here will, will help you better understand how it's set up. Okay, so um, you're looking at the TK daily schedule. So the, the morning starts just like any other classroom with breakfast time. And then one difference is the morning meeting um, chunk is bigger or longer than any of our other uh, grade levels at Hoagland because it encompasses all four components of responsive classrooms. So um, we have, we do the greeting, the sharing, the group activity, and the morning message. So those of you that were there on um, last week got to see all four components of that morning meeting. And so it usually takes about 20 minutes or so, maybe 25 minutes. Um, and so um, as an e the EL teacher, I am in there with um, Shauna, um, and I went to responsive classroom training, so I've kind of taken that over, um, that component. She hasn't been trained yet, but um, I've done that and really enjoyed that. Um, and then the literacy knowledge, that's just like the kindergarten classrooms have. We use the CKLA curriculum and we're co-teaching that together. Um, so I'm, I push in for that whole time. And then it goes to purposeful play, which is another, you know, another part of the, the classroom that's different. It's responsive classroom, different than the other um, classrooms. Go math, just like a kindergarten classroom, lit intervention, ST math. Those are all things that you would see in a kindergarten classroom. They have lunch, they have recess, 
Quiet time then, another component of responsive classroom that Sean is able to have in her schedule. Um, and as you see there, it's just intended for that stress reduction and cognitive development and she gives them different choices to do. Um, and then lit skills, again, same as any other classroom, recess, math flex, their specials they get to go to. Um, and then the centers and the SEL intervention, that just helps reinforce the content skills, like things that we've done during knowledge. Um, Shauna has some centers that they can do some things with that and some other things that she comes up with. And then the closing circle is also a component of responsive classroom. And that gives that closure to the end of the day um, in a purposeful way. So her schedule is built off of including all of those things from responsive classroom. So you would see that if you spent a day with with her. The one thing too to note with the literacy intervention time, that's actually taught by a Title I teacher and it's supported by the TK teacher. So in kindergarten, um, our, our students might go to Title I reading and in TK, the, the title teacher pushes in and really teaches it from a core lens because they all need that extra intervention time. Um, so this is a little bit about um, responsive classroom. Heather talked um, about that. And I just wanted to share um, kind of the foundation of that. You've probably heard about it before, that core belief, um, both for social and the emotional competencies. So you can read those five areas um, that are focused on and um, a high level of focus um, in TK, and then also the academic competencies that are included when we implement all components of responsive classroom, and those five areas are listed up there as well. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so as we talked about with the responsive classroom in the meeting, during our morning meeting, there's four different components, the greeting, the morning message, the sharing, and the group activity. And so in the first video on the left, you're going to see an example of a group activity that's called Would You Rather. So let's go ahead and play that one. If you're going back to school, before you submit your essays, run it through Grammarly to quickly check for spelling, punctuation, or grammar. Pancakes or cereal? Pancakes on this side or cereal on this side? Would you rather have pancakes or cereal? Pancakes or cereal? Choose. Which one would you rather have? Do you want pancakes, Eduardo? Or cereal? You have three, two, one. Alrighty. Are you cereal for pancake people? What do you like to have on your pancakes? What do you like? I like cereal for my pancakes. I say cereal. That sounds good. What about you? I like chocolate chips. Does somebody make you chocolate chips? Yeah, but but I buy them from the store. I eat them for breakfast. That sounds good. What kind of pancakes do you like? Oh, my just do you like anything on your pancakes or just plain pancakes? Yeah. What do, you, do you put syrup on your pancakes? Yeah. <laughs> and then the video on the right, this is an example of a greeting. So that's the first part of responsive classroom, the morning uh, message. Remember the, what is it called? Butterfly wave. Oh, this one's butterfly. Yeah. What is butterfly. Butterfly. butterfly wave. What, is, what else did we do? This one, this one, and then we did. Hi, Joanna. Wave. We waved, and then what else did we do? Good morning. Oh no, no talking, though. No, no talking. Remember, what is this? Good morning. Handshake. So we have butterfly wave. French fry wave. Oh, Richard, stay right there. French fry wave. This time, is there going to be any talking? No. No talking. No talking. Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Come on in, sit down. So in that video, they were practicing. We've learned different ways to do a silent greeting. Um, and because that, like, they can even use, like, in the hallway when we talk about having our voices off, but we can still give a silent greeting to our friends. So they've learned lots of different ways to do that um, as we have gone through um, this, this responsive classroom in the morning meeting. Questions about TK. So how does TK interact with like preschool and regular kindergarten? What's the 
cycle there. Yeah. So um, it's kindergarten. Um, at the end of TK, so conference time come March, we have conversations with, with families on what's next. And the option is kindergarten or first grade. And we will definitely be making recommendations to families based on their data, um, versus based on their development socially and emotionally. Um, generally speaking, um, districts that have TK, the majority of the kids go to kindergarten. Um, I can't say that all of them will and all of them, you know, have. Um, just a generally speaking piece of that. Mm -hmm. So they typically go to kindergarten after TK. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Other questions? The children who are participating in TK, have they gone through preschool? Some yes and some no. Yes. <laughs> and one of the things that we're very careful about is um, that TK doesn't become like a dumping ground for all of these kids who might have you know, maybe some significant behavior concerns or significant academic concerns. And we really look at the individual child um, to try to determine um, the best programming and the best fit for them. And one of the things I know that, that we love is that small group learning time. It's a super supportive, um, but yet opportunities for independence um, within a smaller group. Um, and so that's been beneficial, we feel, for our students. How many are in the regular kindergartens? Um, average class size in regular kindergarten right now is high. I would say anywhere from 22 to close to 25. Mm -hmm. Those are half day. <clears throat> kindergarten's full day. TK's full day. Full day, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tree planting. So September 21st, uh, we had the opportunity to collaborate with um, the University of Northern Iowa, the Center for Energy and Environment Education, as um, with a grant, the Marshalltown Planting Hope Grant, and we were able to plant um, 21 trees around the grounds of Hoagland. So we structured it at Hoagland where um, volunteers within our community um, came along with um, people from that Center of Energy and Environmental Education from University of Northern Iowa, and they really um, planned to engage all of our students in tree planting. So um, the holes were dug, the trees were delivered, the trees were big, which was fantastic, <laughs> And um, but the kids got to um, push dirt in, either with a shovel or with their hands or their feet. Um, they got to help cut the roots of the trees and um, really learn kind of about tree planting. Um, I went out with, with most grade levels, and if I was going to plant a tree in my yard, I would do it very differently than I would have thought. <laughs> so, um, and just taking care of the trees and how it's good for our environment and, and respecting our school grounds, and these are our trees. We planted them, um, and years down the road, they're going to provide um, great shade for our school grounds. So if you go to the next picture, the next slide will show pictures of students engaged in um, the tree planting um, a project that we had at Hoagland. Great opportunity of learning for our kids. Go on to the next one, Sean. Oh, I'm not. I'm not driving the slides. You know that, oh, right? Oh, who's driving the slides? Amy's driving the slides. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got your hand up there. You act like you were. So, okay, Amy, thank you. <laughs> Mallory, Bobcat Buddies. Yep, I'm gonna wrap us up here with just um, touching base on Bobcat Buddies. We were here in May and we talked quite a bit about Bobcat Buddies and we started back up for our second year. So we thought everyone would be interested in hearing just our little update. Um, and so just a quick kind of summary of Bobcat Buddies. It is a program that we started last year um, within our building with um, the intent just that every Hoagland student has a champion adult to connect with. And so our staff members have groups of about seven to nine students that are from different grade levels, so mixed grade level groups. 
And um, we connect with our group members weekly. It could be a note, um, could be stopping in during the morning, um, popping in um, throughout the day, giving them a high five, helping them set a goal, being a friendly face. And then we also um, have monthly um, events and activities that we do together. So we just um, relaunched that in September. We got some new groups. We had to adjust them, obviously, with new staff, new students, fourth graders left, new kindergartners, and TK students. And so we just had our <clears throat> first kind of getting to know you group time launching activity. And we have our second event, um, I think it's this week on Friday. Friday. And mm -hmm. so that will be really exciting to continue with that. So if you go to the next slide, we have some photos of our first Bobcat buddy time from it this year in September. You can just see a few of our groups. And how big are the groups? Yeah, you're going to notice that seven to nine, it looks like a lot more because we put two teachers in a room. So oh, okay. if there's ever a teacher absent, You've got your backup teacher who then takes all like 14. But the picture down here at the bottom shows actually three adults, four adults. Mm -hmm. um, two of them are, are supporting kids more in a one-on-one -on -one basis. But the other two are both leaders of, of the group project time. Okay. And is all the staff involved in Bobcat Buddies, right? Yep. It's not just mm -hmm. teachers. Correct. Okay. Teachers, paraeducators, um, our specialists are are connecting with groups of kids as well. Then what types of activities and projects do you do together mm -hmm. in those groups? Yeah, so we have a monthly focus and um, the first um, activity we always do is just kind of a get to know you. They make, um, decorate their name tags and, and we do something to connect and get to know the people in our group. Um, we have done things with, um, we did some things with diversity um, last year, um, we did some caring projects where we um, actually we wrote notes to many of our directors here at, at central office of thanks. Um, we also did some things where we sent notes, I believe, to um, some of our nursing homes, yeah. our care yeah, facilities in town. Yeah. Um, what else you guys have we done? We did a reading focus. Oh, where yeah. We did mm -hmm. like a reading challenge one month. Mm -hmm. Random acts of kindness, I think, yep. around the building. Yeah, just a variety of things that. You can go to the next slide. There we go. Mm -hmm. Open for questions. So, how much of the responsive classroom is incorporated in the other classes? It's not just TK. Sure. So, um, when we started the 22 23 school year, we had two people trained, myself and a um, Title I reading teacher. I started off right away, because my question was, I just spent four days at this training, like, I want to implement it. So I did TK, that's how I started the year. Um, so every day I would go in, um, and then when Heather got trained, I stepped out of TK, she's now leading TK, and I will jump over to our Significant Disabilities Program and, and start leading it there. Um, we had um, a classroom teacher, um, Heather and EL teacher, our instructional coach. Anybody else trained last time? I think that was it. The oh, three of you. It, yeah. um, was just trained in September. And so they are all responsible for doing some sort of implementation. Our team of five also on our last PD day, um, we're trying to build some capacity within our building. And so we do do our own morning meeting slides for our full building, but teachers now have the options to use the one that we've, re um, that we've planned for the building with a, um, they align to the SEL competencies, um, or they can implement greeting and group activity. And the only reason we gave them two out of the four components to implement is, first of all, it's, it's new learning for them. And second of all, our master schedule for all other grades is not set up to start your days with 20 to 25 minutes of responsive classroom. Mm -hmm. um, we had that choice as a building to set up your master schedule with responsive classroom integration or without. Well, with two people trained, obviously we're gonna do without. <laughs> and, um, but we're really excited and I think our, our building staff 
Um, we're building some excitement and some energy there. And and um, I'm hoping to see some training dates really soon coming out, even for hopefully June. Um, and hopefully we can get a lot of people interested from Hoagland in, in being trained in responsive classroom. But our intent would be those of us who are trained to continue to, through Professional Development Mondays, um, keep giving them little tidbits of learning from responsive classroom. Amy, you shared with us that you had you have conversations with families with regard to whether children should be going to TK Correct. or kindergarten. Um, we do have some private preschools in town as well sure. as Head Start and Micah. Um, are there any conversations going on between those classrooms? Yeah, so Emily is here tonight, and Emily does work with our community preschools, our Head Starts, um, to help them also understand um, what TK is and how to make recommendations, you know, which kids are the right ones. I will tell you, we have a, a long ways to go in that arena. Mm -hmm. um, there is not consistency. Um, Mr. Manis at, at Anson and I are both kind of feeling feeling that. Mm -hmm. um, we have had buildings reach out to us this year. You know, these kids are in our kindergarten classrooms. I think TK would be better for them. And when I talked about that, we have to protect TK so it doesn't mm -hmm. become this dumping ground mm -hmm. of this classroom full of, of behaviors or kids with such low academic skills that um, we have to, ha we need peer models in that program too. And so we're looking for that balance um, there. So we're pretty selective. Um, and there's just, it's new. There's a lot of learning to happen there in terms of what's the right um, way, what are the right conversations to have, who are the right kids mm -hmm. to put in that program. It's good to hear, though, that you're focusing on some of those other programs that are outside the public school right yes. now to help them have really good starts with foundations to get started in school. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> yeah. She does a lot of that work. So I've been, I'm trying to picture this. TK has responsive classroom fully implemented, but kindergarten does not? Nope. Okay. Mm -hmm. And none of our other grade levels are, um, have responsive classroom fully implemented. But is your intent to fully implement it all the way through? It is with all of our elementary schools, um, but it takes staff training. We can't right. expect implementation. And responsive classroom is a four-day training, mm -hmm. and so we're asking teachers to do it um, in the summer. Um, or we were able to send three people in September, um, but one of those was a classroom teacher. And we did have to do some coverage within our own building. Mm -hmm. Our intent was also to to send um, Deshauna, who's our TK teacher. Uh, we just didn't have enough subs and we didn't have enough um, people within our building um, to cover for a full four days. It is mm -hmm. hard, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Us. Nice thank work, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we bring you guys our October 17th student board report. Okay, so for sports, um, the volleyball team plays their regional game tomorrow, October 18th, against Ames at Ames High School. The Marshalltown football team has a three-game win streak coming in this week, and they play four and four Des Moines North team this Friday here at home. It also happens to be senior night as well. And the Marshalltown girls swim team has a conference swim meet tomorrow, October 18th, and Thursday, October 20th at the YMCA here in Marshalltown. Okay, and it is that magical time of the year once more. It's college readiness season. So um, college-bound juniors even are starting to think about where should I go to college? How am I going to pay for things? So they're starting to go out on campus visits, both individually and with the schools. College-bound seniors, a lot of them are working on their applications, and some of them have even already been accepted to their 
first choice schools, which is always good. Scholarships and FAFSA, FAFSA, FAFSA. FAFSA. is something that a lot of students are working on and contemplating. Some seniors are going to be taking or retaking the ACTs, which are always um, implemental for scholarship um, receiving, I guess. Mm -hmm. And while a lot of schools are ACT optional nowadays, that is always recommended if you're trying to obtain that extra kind of economical assistance. And the next date is this Saturday, October 22nd. So do wish them luck. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pick, kind of piggyback again on what Isenia said. So um, this October 12th, students just were tested for PSAT. Uh, 20 to 30 students were tested, and many of them took it for the second time, and they felt that they were more confident in their performance. Um, I wanted to give a virtual math update. Um, teachers had their trainings October 7th with prisms and headsets. There were 20 teachers, instructional coaches, and administrators that attended. Teachers explored algebra lessons and the dashboard to see how they could improve and implement it in their classrooms. 30 VRs will be used for geometry and algebra. They will be rotated between Marshalltown High School, Miller, and MLA. They are developing content for science and math into middle school and high school. Uh, you can refer back to the sheets I passed out beforehand in the meeting. Um, Trunk or Treat will be hosted by Student Senate this year. And you guys are welcome to attend and bring your own candy. It will take <laughs> it, it will take place on October thirty first from five thirty to seven p.m. But you can get there earlier around four thirty. It's open to local businesses, groups, or clubs. So feel free to invite any businesses like the YMCA, Emerson, La Careta, any local businesses um and also there will be a competition on who has the best vehicle so yes the qr code leads to a google doc you can sign up and register thank you just to clarify on the prism so there were there, there's 30 headsets that are designated for the high school and other 30 headsets that are designated for the middle school, but likely to be used mostly at the high school um, until the general math curriculum becomes available, which will make it more universal. So there's actually 60 headsets that will be able to be rotated between MHS, MMS, and MLA. So, so do you know the teachers tried out the headsets? Were they excited? Uh, from my teacher, Mrs. Pierce, I think they were excited. Okay. Yes. <laughs> what I heard. But you haven't seen them yet in the classroom. No, I have okay. not seen them. <laughs> I heard they're coming soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So in light of uh, Paulette's absence, I'm going to handle the preliminary certified enrollment report that she generally gives. Um, and I'll say up front, this is a good news story. <laughs> so when we look at enrollment as far as... Uh, what we report to the state, what the state ascertains from our student management systems. There's actual enrollment, so total number of resident students that live within the Marshtown Community School District that become part of the headcount. <clears throat> There's certified enrollment, which is a modification of that actual enrollment. It takes into account weightings for um, like dual credit classes, special education, dual enrollment students. Uh, non-public students in terms of some flow through and that sort of thing and that's actually the number that um, is utilized for purposes of determining funding and then there's 
the served enrollment, which takes into account uh, both the resident students, the open enrolled students in, and the open enrolled students out. But the number generally that we focus on for financial purposes is that um, is that uh, certified enrollment number. So if you could flip and go to the next slide. So this uh, chart shows both uh, the certified enrollments over the course of, looks like eight or nine years, uh, the past eight or nine years, and, and then it also shows our served enrollment. And you see a big discrepancy there because I think most of you are aware we have a significant number of students that open and roll out versus open and rolling in. Um, but the good news is, is that we have an increase um, from the previous two years of uh, both served students as well as um, certified. certified enrollment. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that have been on the board for a while, um, Karina, Sean particularly, um, we, we had a couple enrollment studies done uh, by an outside entity to help us with some financial projections. RSP out of Kansas City is who provides that for us. Our first one we had was probably in 2017 uh, pre-tornado. And as you'll remember in 2018, we had a significant decrease in enrollment after uh, that tornado J July 18th. And then, um, and then we rebounded in a big way the following year. Uh, we gained more students than we had lost the previous year. And then we had a similar phenomenon happen in 2020 with that count, uh, which may have been in part pandemic related and job related relative to the pandemic, or it might have been in part duration related in terms of additional um, issues that families were faced with. But um, <clears throat> given the fact that the duration and the pen, if it had just been the duration, I would have anticipated a pretty quick rebound like what we saw with the tornado. But because we had both the duration and we were dealing with a global pandemic, I wasn't personally quite sure what was going to happen. And so it's taken a little bit longer, but as you'll see this year, we've had a significant rebound, which would pretty much lend itself to what RSP had said, which is that there's going to be some ups and downs. It may feel a little bit like a roller coaster over time, but at the end of the day, whether you're looking five years out or maybe even 10 years out, the Marshtown um, enrollment counts are going to stay relatively balanced uh, to as a total. You know, your large groups and your smaller classes may be at different junctures, but the overall enrollment should stay relatively the same. So if you go to the next um, slide, uh, this shows the the trend lines as it relates to open enrolled out versus open enrolled in. And as you can see with the open enrollment in, we continue to experience slight increases in number of students coming in. I think this year from last year, we had an increase of about nine students, uh, but we actually had an uptick in open enrollment out this year, which kind of goes against the trend. The trend had been a reduction of open enrollment out, and we have an increase in open enrollment out of uh, 29 students. So if the, the net loss is about 20 students between the 29 going out and the nine additional that are coming in there. Um, how much, if any of that, is a product of the change in the law, I, I don't know at this point. Um, but uh, time will tell as we see what happens throughout the school year with that. Uh, the next slide um, just shows kind of by levels, um, grade levels in terms of the, the uh, where the larger groups are and some of the smaller groups. And as I think most people know, we've been, we've been experiencing and graduating some of the largest classes that we have in the district. And we've been um, 
bringing in as far as preschool, kindergarten goes, smaller classes and what we're graduating. But um, <clears throat> the nature of our district, you can't, in a lot of districts, you can project your what's going to happen with your certified enrollment based on kindergartners in and seniors going out. But in our district, there's so much mobility, upwards of 20 to sometimes 25% of our 5,000 students move in and out on an annual basis that uh, more times than not, any gaps that are created by seniors out and kindergartners in are oftentimes filled by new students coming in at any time during <coughs> the school year in those other grades. I am noticing a large K-4 bunch. Yeah, we're actually... Yeah, we're going to run into trouble in the middle school, aren't we? It's already pretty crowded. Well, we're going to... Um, we're going to experience some of the low, lowest class sizes that they've had for a few years, which we've been experiencing in the elementary schools before some of those larger groups come up. But our largest uh, class right now, um, I think the eighth grade class would be the largest class of anything K-8. So there's actually going to be smaller classes that will be coming through the middle school. So I'm confused by your chart then. Well, there's five grade levels, K through four, right, Jan? Yeah, K through four, and then you've got would five, be five grade eight. levels, but five through eight is only so, four So five, six, levels. and seven are really small, so eight's big enough to... Right. Oh, they're small enough to go, okay. Now I get it. Right. Okay. And again, the good news is after having a few years of much smaller um, incoming students at the preschool and kindergarten level, those are starting to, to grow once again. Hey, I had a question on this one, Dr. Schutte. The one with the, yeah. I understand or I've always thought anyway, that the jump from sixth to seventh is in part because the Catholic school goes K through six and then we get some of those kids come in there. What accounts for that jump from eighth grade to ninth grade? Do you have any idea? Um, you, you know, I, I don't other than the fact that I believe that that historically is a juncture for which I think the students that attend the Christian school could um, come over. So if they so choose, some of them come over at, um, at middle school or maybe at Lenahan, but ultimately if they wanted to stay in that programming, it goes through eighth grade and then they could come over. But I think a, a large uh, part of that is I think we probably have a lot of students who were open and rolled out that are coming back at that juncture because they're recognizing the significant difference in course <coughs> offerings and extracurricular offerings and other things that the high school has. Yeah, because I mean that, I mean you're, the ninth grade class has almost 450 kids. Yeah. That's just amazing. Mm -hmm. So and we've had a little bit of discussion about that. Paul App pointed that out too as a, a trend and just based on anecdotal conversations that I've been hearing from people and I think Sean has been hearing from people. I think a lot of that is, you know, when people really look at what we have to offer versus what others are offering that they're, it's appealing for them to either come back or come into our district at that point. Yeah, because there's actually up 23 from eighth grade of 22 is 424, and then it goes up another 23. That's a pretty big jump. Yeah, and, and again, too, um, you know, uh, we have influx of families all the time throughout the, the course of the year, and so... Um, we don't, we're not down to the detail of knowing how many of those students are at a particular grade level that they come as a result of their parents um, accessing jobs and that sort of thing. But um, I, w I will mention that the, the numbers that are being shared are preliminary. The state has been very specific about saying, please do not treat these as golden numbers until we get into the 1st of November. And and they have made sure that uh, within their system there haven't been any glitches or sure. that there aren't any uh, changes. But 
essentially for uh, certified enrollment purposes, uh, we'll have an increase of 87.39 students. Um, in our resident student count, there's uh, a jump of 53 students for uh, total students served, an increase of 66 students. So when you take out that, that net loss of approximately 20 students for student enrollment, you know, it, it jumps down from 87 for financial purposes counting, but some of those dollars will flow with those children. Uh, but it'll feel more like a true uh, increase of 67 students, which is which is significant. And um, I think on the next to last slide, maybe um, Paulette has given well on the last yeah the next to last slide she states that you know with this kind of increase in student enrollment if. We're at 2% as far as the state increase uh, gets determined by the legislature. That's going to be be a 3.68% increase for us um, in funding. And then if it winds up being as high as 25 that'll be the equivalent of 4.19 increase. And we haven't seen those levels of increase in quite some time, probably, so, probably since pre-pandemic for sure. So... So anyway, it's a good news story as far as certified enrollment. Um, hopefully next year we can get back on that trajectory of re, you know continuing to reduce open enrollment out and increasing open enrollment in. Uh, those numbers are relatively small in terms of the differential, but uh, the aggregate numbers obviously are large. So any questions? I guess I, I think I would just want to piggyback. Um, kind of a story then ask another question is I, I'm coaching uh, youth activities and I had a parent come up to me about a month ago and talked about their experience in Marshalltown they moved to a different district and um, they opened and rolled their kid back here uh, after they found out what curriculum we offer and how well their student was doing in the Marshalltown school district so the open enrollment back here is a plus the question I have is we talked about mobility issues with um, kids, you know, coming from employer and a couple employers in town where they come various times during the year with a new law change with open enrollment. Are they going to calculate it differently? And would that help us with some of the kids we get past October? Um, no. Um, it, I, I think there will need to be some adjustments. Uh, I know that we've got a couple uh, regulations relative to open enrollment that we've made an adjustment on based on the, the legal change that took place, doing away with the deadline. But I think that there's going to need to be more um, information, especially relative to how the funding works with that. Now that, um, now that people could essentially open enroll in or out at any time of the year and not have to file by a March 1st deadline. So even though, for example, we'll be recommending approval of or um, marking as reviewed some policies today, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those policies and or regulations come back to you this year as they figure out some of the things they didn't think about when that decision was made. Um, but. Uh, what happens is, uh, with open enrollment anyway, uh, you can get, um, or changes in enrollment, you can get authority to spend dollars on behalf of those students. You just don't have the cash to back it up until the following year. So. And, um, you know, again, uh, you know, it's just kind of the nature of our community and the jobs when you know, when our largest employer has a mobility rate of, you know, whatever it is now, 30 to 35 percent or whatever, you know, that's going to largely impact um, our, our student numbers throughout the year with students in, students out. So, other questions or comments?
Okay, so item 5.02, the pandemic funding overview, um, needs to be tabled. So we need a motion to table that. So moved. Second. McGinnis Stanley, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries seven to zero. So we'll take that off the table at some point in the future. All right, we're up for pickleball court update and Doug D. Mullinaire uh, from did you Garling. Want to, did you want to do 503? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, skip that. Um, 503, voluntarily retirement. Now, uh, every year the board is charged with making a determination whether we're going to offer voluntarily retirement or not. Um, last year, uh, Early retirement by most districts is looked at as a financial tool to help balance a budget. Um, and it's particularly helpful if um, you know, you're experiencing continual um, decline in enrollment and your budget is reflective of that. And obviously, uh, the people you're incentivizing generally to consider retiring maybe a little bit earlier than they normally would are some of your higher paid employees and then oftentimes, but not always, you're bringing in lower paid employees. So there's a, a cost savings there. Um, with our certified enrollment being as strong as it is this year, uh, with the report you heard from Paulette at our last meeting on the state of our fiscal health, which is extraordinarily strong uh, right now, um, I would recommend to the board that we choose not to enact a voluntary early retirement or not offer it this year. Staff shortages also obviously play into yeah, that. And la thinking. last year it played in, but again, having been a couple years from when we had offered it, um, really felt like um, there was a need to provide an off-ramp for people who qualified for that, which was the only reason. Um, as it turned out, you know, we wound up in a very similar place, but with different pos unfilled positions, even when offering uh, early retirement from the year before. But um, obviously the staff shortage uh, factors into that as well. You know, why incentivize people to go earlier than they ordinarily would if you're having difficulty filling the positions that you have. Well, when you look at our projection from our certified enrollment, it looks like we may be needing to offer it again in a few years, even if we're not offering it now, because your numbers are going to start going down on your students, correct? Um, it's hard to tell. Um, more, more years than not, we've had increases, but again, to what degree, um, you know, the tornado, the duration on the pandemic created relative to those decreased in enrollments. Um, that was, <clears throat> those were big issues as it related to the years of decline that we had, I believe. So um, it's just hard to know, I think, and that's why it's important to, to address this every year. Well, it makes sense. It does. It's just that I'm looking at Ninth grade, 445. Eighth grade, 426. Then you get down to second grade, you're down to 342. So if those numbers hold, yeah, you do need to address it every year because it's going to change every year what your needs are. So I'm agreeing with you. Other or questions or any other comments? If not, is there a motion to approve not offering the early retirement incentive for fiscal year 2023? Move to approve. Second. Lowry McGinnis, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries seven to zero. Okay. <clears throat> now we've invited Doug Dee Molinaire from Garling to speak to us and provide an update on the pickleball courts. And Doug had contacted me indicating that, um, oh, oh, okay, that he would need to call in versus be here personally. Doug. 
Hi, Doug. This is Theron. You ready? Yeah. I'm ready. Okay. Good. Well, I had just shared with everyone that I had asked um, if you would present an overview as to where things are standing on at, with the pickleball courts. Uh, as people know or remember, um, last February, March, we started to recognize there was a a bit of an issue with the wall as it started bowing and then of course in April when we had the high wind event we had uh, the collapsing of the northernmost part of that pickleball wall which was very visible and and then over time we've had uh, you know more of the soil or the earth uh, fall from that area which has resulted in damage at least to the northernmost pickleball court and us um, cordoning that off so that people didn't use it for safety reasons. And so um, often myself as well as uh, our board members are asked by the general public where are things at, and I thought it would be best to, for them to hear it from you. I understand. Um, good evening, everyone. And uh, I, I'm Doug DeMillner. I'm the owner of Garlic Construction. Um, <clears throat> we've been... Uh, the way this started out, obvious, there was a problem with the wall, and through some investigation, we come to find out early on that Brian um, uh, Graff with Dirt to Turf, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, skipped a step, a very important step, and did not have the wall engineered. Uh, any wall over four foot, as common knowledge, has to be engineered. Um, he, didn't, he didn't get it done. So, nonetheless, that's the bottom line of why the wall failed. Now, I wish I could be an insurance person and lie about when I'd have reports and not have any deadlines whatsoever, but uh, I, I don't live in that world, and this has been very frustrating. I wanted to fix this immediately. Um, however, there had to be expert uh, inspections on both sides by numerous uh, forensic inspectors and on both insurance sides and that took forever and ever and ever um, so we got we finally got the report back and I think Darren might have shared that with you but the process is we are putting together the cost to get everything repaired to the best of our knowledge, uh, with there may be more stuff once we get into the process. For example, right now, we're tearing out anything that's four foot above the footing. I don't know the depth of that footing. We have to verify that. We have a contractor coming to verify that. And we'll know the extent of the walls we're taking out and the walls we're replacing. Ideally, I would like to get the wall portion done this year yet. Um, we're outside the window on um, the timing to get asphalt laid and the coating to the asphalt. There's a curing process involved in that that I cannot, uh, I can't short step that and do it wrong or then we'll have another issue. So <clears throat> until I determine how much of the wall's coming out on Friday with my uh, block wall builder, I, I do not know at this time. I'm hoping it's, I mean, it could be all of it. I, I don't think that's the case, but uh, once we have that, we'll get a schedule together on when the repairs are going to be done. Um, there's a lot of phasing to this, as you guys can probably imagine. This is not a, um inexpensive fix, and there's multiple phases of how this needs to be done. Um, we'll start with tearing out the wall, removing fence in the areas that the wall is going to come out. Uh, we have to remove asphalt and anything that was undermined. Um, and we have to get fill back in. Uh, and the wall has to be put in per engineer's recommendations. Um, I don't know how much asphalt's coming out, but if there's any question on any of it undermined, it's coming out and being replaced. So to have a good rock base, so there's no issues down the road. So once the asphalt's put back on, I'm sorry, I skipped a step. Once the wall's built, they will be in installing the foundations uh, 
uh, and some, some sauna tube, I believe, is how they're going to end up doing this and, and kind of building the wall around the sauna tube to hold the concrete piers for the fence. And once that's done and backfilled, they'll pour the piers for the fence. Uh, they'll put the new fence in. We'll put down the asphalt. We'll put down the coating. And then after the coating, we have to restripe. And then there'll be some landscaping repairs from where we're going to tear out the retaining wall and put it back. Yeah, I had not, uh, the inspection report that you sent to me this morning, I didn't have, I had barely time to review it myself, let alone uh, send it to the board, so I hadn't done that yet. It, 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 it's pretty boring. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of useless information in there. It's, it's kind of a boring report. But, but the bottom line is anything four foot higher than the footing has got to come out and be redone. And I am uh, going to engage CGA and pay them to be uh, basically your eyes um, so that uh, everything goes back and uh, they can see what's going on. They can review submittals, whatever you guys are comfortable with. No, no money is going to be charged to the school for this. It's all my insurance is, is picking up all of it, and then they will go after the responsible parties um, to, to handle that part. So it took a long time to get there, and uh, I, I really, I mean, I'm not going to make excuses for the insurance companies, but that's, that's what held the whole process up. I can assure you of that. I'm hopeful that we only disturb the North Court and the South, too, are available for spring. Uh, however, uh, I'm not going to short uh, the process. Uh, if it needs to come out, it's got to come out. Yeah, and I think, um, I think we'd all be in agreement that we want, you know, everybody wants it done right, and and not to have future problems with it. So, you know, that'll be something of interest to find out if, depending on how the wall needs to be rebuilt and all of that, whether um, the southern portion of that complex can continue or remain stable versus having movement of soil. And I know that one of the issues that was in the report was there was no mechanism for draining moisture from that wall away which I think would be a problem at any juncture of that wall. Um, and then I think there was, there was some reinforcement geo grid or something that was supposed to be uh, put in there as well to keep the wall or the soils from moving, right? Well, anything over four foot, yes, that's common sense. I mean, it's kind of like when you fill a glass of water, you fill it on the open end. I mean, that, that's how common sense this was. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, the geotech fabric is the key. Uh, that's it. I mean, if that was in there, we wouldn't be talking about this wall at all. So, And I'm aware of the tile, and I, I do not know on the tile if that is where the wall exceeds four foot or if that's all of it or if they're going to trench something in or not. I'm not sure on that process yet, but I can assure you this is all going to be done correctly. And um, uh, I told the insurance company I'm going to, I'm going to engage CGA to review um, the process, uh, the products, and uh, make sure, um, the, I mean, the schools, that can be kind of your uh, third party, and, I, and I'll pick up the bill for them to do that. When do you, based on this timing, when do you think you'll know if the South Courts will end up being part of this remodel? The South two courts? Yeah. I believe there's two there, correct? Yeah, there's three courts. Right. Uh, I want to say, I want to say at the end of next week, I should know it. Okay. We're either going to probe or I'm going to dig along there to figure out what we got. Because I got to get, my landscaper needs to get ordered materials and get the everything in for my insurance company. So, uh, regard whatever happens Friday, we may be back Monday with a small excavator to dig it up and determine where we're going to go. And I understand you guys will need to have notice on that. We're not just going to show up and all of a sudden the whole thing's tore, tore, tore up. I won't do that. I'll keep you. I know this is political. 
and I know uh, there's a lot of important people and patrons that appreciate the uh, facility. And I, if I could go over there tonight and wave a magic wand and fix it, I'd be there. Um, well, I, I but that's, uh, that, that, that's the process. Yeah, I suspect, Doug, if you had a magic wand, you'd have waved it a long time ago. <laughs> uh, correct. It probably would wore out by now, but anyway. <laughs> Doug, a uh, couple things. Um, every week I get hit up by citizens, uh, and I want to make sure their voice is heard. On the South Courts, um, they're claiming that the, the court may be leaning, tilting a little bit. Can you verify that, or has that been verified? Is, and, and the second thing is the wall is not on the, it'd be the south side, is not four foot, but just looking at it from an eye scope, it is not level. Um, Will that be addressed when you do the four foot high to wrap around so it's all level again and properly done? I'd have to look at the design documents. I'm not 100% sure that was poured level because they're going to want drainage off of it. So, but yeah, I somebody had mentioned that. And if there's any settling going on underneath of it, that's going to be rectified. I can, that's, yeah, I, but I got to check the specifications uh, because these things tend to have a little bit of slope on them. Um, so you don't have puddles if you're out there playing on it after a rain. You don't have to squeegee off puddles. But we'll be looking at the original specifications to make sure nothing else is settled. If anything's undermined, it's 100 percent being torn out and redone. But I heard the 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 concern about it settling or sloping, and we'll verify all that as well. Any other questions? When they re if they have to report half the courts, will it match up, look the same as the other half, uh, the color or whatever the court looks like, or would it look totally different? Um, what I'm going to do, and I get my quotes from my uh, athletic uh, coding contractor, I will simply ask him, if there's any fading on that, we'll just go ahead and recoat the whole thing. It's got to look new. I'm not going to have this look like a patch. I understand the concern, and I have that as well. I, I'm not going to go paint the corner of this, and it looks like the the patch corner. It's a conversation piece for years to come. We're not going to have that. Good question. Does anybody have anything else? Well, thank you very much for uh, speaking to us today on this, Doug, and we'll look forward to... Uh, um, Catching up in a couple weeks when some of those, yep. uh, some more information is known on the what needs to be done. Yeah, we're still determining scope, but I've got the green light to get bids and get the process going from all the insurance companies. So I'm clear. I'm clear to go, and uh, the process has started. And uh, just bear with me. I'm I'm doing the best I can. Um, Want to get the the work done this fall? We can. Um, but some of this is weather related, and uh, we, we got to do it right. One last question, Doug. The, con the, the subcontractor will not, the one that, that did this will not be touching this, correct? That's correct. All he right. will never work for my company again. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, by insurance sakes, we had to kind of get out of that too, because there is some legality that he gets a chance to fix it, and I kind of raised my. <laughs> raise my hand on that one and I don't think anybody would be comfortable with that so no this guy's done multiple retaining walls for us that are as difficult if not more difficult than the one we're looking at so and like I said it will, it will be engineered 100% They'll, they even engineer how the posts go in how they're set and that step um, apparently the wall builder didn't think it was that big of a deal so he's paying for it now Well, thank you very if much. Anything else comes, yeah, if anything else comes up, uh, just send me an email, uh, and uh, I'll answer. But I will be back to you no later than uh, mid to late next week with a reply on the um, on the uh, scope of what we're going to get into. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Yep, you too.
Okay. We've arrived at policies. And I think, Zach, you had policies tonight, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Yes. So the first one was uh, 501.14-R, open enrollment, uh, sending district uh, regulations. Uh, basically, the only thing we did here is update the legal references and uh, recommend Mark is reviewed. And the IS, ISB, IASB does not have matching regulations towards this. Any questions? All right. 501.15-R, open enrollment, dash, receiving district regulations. Uh, basically, uh, like we talked about, remove the March 1st deadline. Uh, and uh, again, the ISB does not have matching regulations. Uh, this would be a first reading to amend. Any questions? Yeah, so that'll come back. Yep. For first that one will have to come back. Yep. Okay. All right. What does it mean when it doesn't have ISB regulations? They well, they it's not a policy. The for district Iowa. at some point created their own regulations okay. with their attorney, probably, um, and there may have been something that drove their desire or need to do that. But that's something that we can take a look at once it appears that ISB finalizes whatever it is that they're gonna. Include in the policy, we might be able to get rid of the regulations and just have the policy if that is determined to be sufficient. But more times than not, unless we really determine there's no reason for the redundancy, we um, try to keep those regulations just because we know they were developed with something in mind uh, by the previous boards. The last one is 501.16, homeless children and the youth. Uh, basically, all we've been doing is updating the cross-references and mark it as reviewed. Thanks, Zach. Uh, looking at reminders, Sarah has policies for the November 7th meeting. Um, we've got the schedule there of upcoming presentations to the board. And then just a reminder about committee meetings that may be upcoming. Um, committee reports. Do we need to go back Oops. to communications for Adam? Oh, I skipped Adam. Oh, <laughs> Adam, how? And you just sat there and didn't say anything. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so I I didn't have a, a very long uh, update tonight. Just wanted to um, make sure you all were aware. I was able to meet with Juicebox uh, regarding our athletics and activities website. That meeting went really well, and I was able to get on the record on with the advice of uh, Ryan Isgrig. I uh, was able to make a decision on that layout. So um, I'm really happy to have that done. Um, and right now we're also just uh, going through and making sure that everything looks just like we want it for uh, the student and staff uh, when they open their Chromebooks, kind of the hub page that they see. First of all, based on our current timeline, we are still on schedule for, um, for completion in January 2023, as we had previously, uh, previously discussed. So um, otherwise, uh, along with the reminders that Sean was sharing, I wanted to add that we do have uh, for this Friday, uh, as a reminder to staff, we're going to be uh, inviting everyone to wear pink for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So, and that is all from me. Any questions for Adam? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Then for committee reports, the only one that I'm aware of is the ACER committee, which was today. Yeah, so ACER met today, and most of the entities were able to be represented. It was the first time we had been back to an in-person meeting since pre-pandemic, so that was kind of nice. Um, both the county and city talked a lot about um, 
construction projects which were coming to closure as we head into the winter. Um, I think the biggest one to note from the county was talking about um, their transitioning into the courthouse uh, with the idea of being completely out by um, the latter part of December. And of course we have the closing on the Orpheum coming January 9th. So we talked a little bit about that. Um, I thought it was encouraging to hear both uh, the city administrator and the mayor talk about um, opportunities for housing and living growth uh, within the community and different grants and stuff that are kind of in play there. And then John Hall from the chamber also talked about um, some exciting possibilities relative to business growth and job growth uh, within the community as well in addition to some housing opportunities too with the potential of a maybe a new hotel and downtown and that sort of thing. Um, anything else to note? Um, Iowa Valley talked about their construct their oh. construction project and then their um, eSports yeah. program. Yeah. Well, uh, any items? For future agendas for consideration? What? I, oh, sorry, just, um, we're still running into, you know, every time you come up, we ask people about the pink sheet. Just finding some way to get more community feedback. I don't know. I know Adam's worked on some things. Maybe getting an update on that. How do we hear from different segments of the community? How are we contacting them? What have we done this evening to improve education for the students in Marshalltown? I think it was a couple things from this week is that TK program is great to be able to sit on that earlier this last week to, to advocate community, you know, of kids, newer kids coming to the school district of alternative programs, such as TK. It was a great presentation along with uh, the Bobcat Buddy program was, was uh, it's a great program that uh, we need to get the whole school district behind on the elementary side. Uh, and then the other thing, I think pickleball. I think everybody wanted to hear a little bit more about what's mm -hmm. going on there. So it's a great update. Um, yeah. I also think it's um, an excellent thing that our schools are reaching out to Head Starts and, mm -hmm. and other um, private preschool opportunities to help educate parents and also those adults who are working with the children as to what the opportunities are transitioning into the public school and setting um, the standards for a good foundation having kids being placed where their needs are going to be met in a timely fashion rather than becoming reactive. Mm -hmm. So it's very proactive. And so once again, it's partnering with our community, the school district partnering, partnering with our community so that um, we provide services that, that children need. When, and, when they're talking that presentation, when I went there the other day, also, I could think about relate my own kid who has a late birthday and struggle early on in her, early on. If what would her what would it look like now for her if she did that pre K? Mm -hmm. And as data, we get more data the next couple of years. It'll be interesting for the parents that chose the kinder, just regular kindergarten route versus the pre K route, and and look at those age differences of birthdays to see how do they compare what the data says. So it'd be quite interesting, so. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential for that transitional kindergarten to expand. Well, something that didn't come up at this meeting, but I know there were at least three board members and Theron were there. Uh, there was a parent meeting at Miller where they talked, when you talk about my communicating with the community, uh, where a high school teacher and a college student presented to Spanish speaking parents on how to start preparing um, saving for college, preparing their students to be ready to get scholarships, what they need to do. And it was really, it was well done. And so that was. 
and planting that seed, which I thought was neat to help the parents out and and the kids, um, you know, educate that there is there is a way. There is a way, right? And the parents had good questions. Good questions, very good questions, yeah. And the opportunities, I think, uh, that Dr. Shooty and others shared that I didn't even know were offered in the community also, so. I was gonna comment on the Bobcat Buddies concept. Mm -hmm. um, just the kit, I liked that they were making those adult connections, getting that cross uh, pollination across the different grade levels. Um, some things I think maybe Hoagland has done a little bit in the past, but really formalizing that. Um, and I know my kids, when they get that letter from the teacher, it raises that excitement level. Or when they get to mentor, you know, someone in a different grade level, or all of those things just help increase their level of excitement in school and wanting to be there. And so um, feeling confident and really helping with that social emotional learning and knowing that there's an adult there that cares about them or other kids there even that care about them. Um, so I think that's a great step forward. Okay. Well, we are going to take a five minute break and then we'll come back and we'll go into closed session. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.